All right. Well, if everyone wants to get seated, this is the closing address for uh, PyCon 2012. Thank you once again, everyone, for coming. Now, admittedly, this is the most people I've ever seen at a closing ceremony for a PyCon, but there may be some incentives, I understand. Interesting. So, we've got a little bit of a raffle first, but not for the robot. Um, so, Yannick will take care of that very quickly. We've got some really cool stuff. And uh, not a robot, but I'm pretty sure you guys are not here for that. Um, we've got a bunch of books by Prentice Hall. We've got some uh, goodies from Elegant Stitches, some t-shirts, and some beer glasses from Eucalyptus. Gift certificates for Think Geek uh, licenses for PyCharm, and this beautiful stained glass Python logo <laughs> by John Morrissey. So I'm going to keep this for, for the end. And some people said that maybe we were a bit biased with the Frisbee uh, launches. That's why we brought a left-handed Frisbee thrower to help us. <laughs> We've got Lawrence and Wesley who are going to help us launch Frisbees in a non-biased way. Leave, leave it to a group of Python people to complain about the distribution of Python uh, Frisbee throwing. And so, uh, <laughs> Go for it. When you pick a frisbee, the baby. come to the front and, and trade it for uh, an item, and we're going to reuse the frisbees right there because we have a lot of items to distribute. Other way. Don't worry, we probably still have some more. More coming. You gotta hit this side of the room now, Yannick. You bias the other way now. Don't throw it that hard. <laughs> okay, Th this one is a special one. It's blue, transparent, with a black outline for the Python logo stained glass. Okay, can you randomize me? Okay, ra randomize me. Yeah, yeah, randomize me. Yeah, turn, turn me, don't turn me. Whoa. <laughs> I'm going to throw up. <laughs> Don't you hurt my precious. Are, are we out of goodies? Are we out of goodies? No, we're not out of goodies. Whoa. That almost took somebody's face off. Cheers. <laughs> Don't hurt my precious. Are we out? No one's holding on to a frisbee, right? You're like coming up and actually redeeming yeah, it so we can redeem, redeem your frisbees as soon as you catch them because uh, we're throwing them uh, as soon as we have stuff. Now we've got resource starvation. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I did want a t-shirt cannon, but apparently you can't bring CO2 on a plane or rent them on short notice. <laughs> are we out yet? Anybody still with frisbees that they are holding on to? I thought this just moved faster than the one last year. Is number 302 in the room? Damn, son. We're done. We're done? Yeah. Congratulations, everyone. Congratulations. And also, thank you. Thank you to all the sponsors and everyone who provided raffle prizes. Um, it's really great that we can do stuff like this. 
Um, so, first off, I wanted to pass my personal thanks to every single staff member and every single volunteer who made this conference possible. We're talking hundreds of volunteers, thousands of man hours. PyCon this year really was amazing. I mean, it's, I almost cried in my opening address, and um, I'm not going to do that now. Um, because there, there, don't do that. Um, so many of you chose to show up and become part of this. I've so I met so many people for, to whom this was their first PyCon. And like I said in the beginning, this was a labor of love. It was a labor of a lot of people, and it's been an honor. So thank you to all of you. And again, thank you to the Python Software Foundation. This is backed. They take the risk. They do everything. Now, admittedly, I'm, a I'm on the board of directors, so I get to see behind the curtain. But Big thanks go to them for taking care of all of this and making this possible. And just some miscellaneous sprinters, stay until after the lightning talks tonight. Um, we've got instructions on where you're going to be assigned. We've got the introduction to sprints, so on and so forth. I hope to see all of you there. Um, it'll be pretty awesome. Uh, the date. PyCon 2013 will be here. Same bat time, same bat channel. Um, follow me or the PyCon Twitter account for updates. It will be March 13th through the 21st. <laughs> and I'm sure it overlaps with South by Southwest, but I really don't care. Um, this is the survey. Please take the survey. Help us make it better. Videos will be posted online. And now for the robot. This is a tender moment. He means a lot to me. He says cute little things like nook nook. So now I'm going to actually curse myself and uh, try to do a live programming demo. Can I, can I do that? Where, where's my screen? There it is. So I'm not going to make it huge because it doesn't really need to be, but uh, all right. So I'm going to load it up in B Python. I'm going to import random. You can all see this. I'm not cheating. Oh, come on, Jesus! You guys are even. And you wonder why I don't post the Python dev anymore. Christ. <laughs> so I've got a file. It's, uh, it's got all the uh, attendees in it. And I'm just going to load it up. Split the lines. Guy X. And who's going to be the winner? What do you mean, what's the length? <laughs> oh, I won! I'm so proud. I'm so proud. But I, I got to make sure. Oh, look at that! What do you mean, random's not reliable? Come on! All right, I'll open up the right file. Hmm. Do, 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 do. B Python is cool. Yeah. There. You happy? The length of this one is 2007, not one. <laughs> so. This is the moment of truth. Um, no more bike shedding. I mean, it's really stupid code. Come on. All right. 
So, remember, this person has to be in the room. If they're not, I'm going to keep printing until somebody is in the room. Is Math, Math, Matthew Hooker in the room? Oh, that's too bad. (laughs) Pat Poles. Oh, oh, (laughs) no. Wow, this is kind of brutal. Caesar. Where is he? Oh. See my ID? Oh, oh, oh. Oh, oh, oh. It's expired. <laughs> there you go. And, um. Can I get the strap too? Oh, yeah, the baby yarn comes with it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's pretty baller. <laughs> I need to take it on the plane like that. Yeah, you, dude, walk through TSA with it like this. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Oh, here we go. There you go. There you go. Oh, no, 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 no. You got to take the strap. I was serious about that. Congratulations. See, that was actually completely fair. I don't know him from Adam, so there you go. I really want him a robot. <laughs> now I'm sad. <laughs> so, in closing, before the final lightning talks, again, thank you. Congratulations to Caesar for winning the robot. Um, I really want that robot. Um, I need to go drink. Um, thank you to all of you for coming. Thank you to all the staff. Thank you to the AV crew. Thank you to everyone who made this possible. It's been an honor. I will be more than happy to see you next year. Thank you. Am I out? All right, now we're going to kick off the final lightning talk session. So if you'll just wait just a moment, we'll get everyone set up. All right, I think we are ready to get started. First up will be Chris Colbert speaking about enamel. Okay, let's see if I get my uh, screen coming up here. All right. So I'm going to talk about a uh, new framework we've been working on. So first off, uh, my name is Chris Colbert. Um, I, uh, I'm with InThought, and uh, I'm going to talk about Enamel, which is a framework for writing declarative user interfaces. And I don't know why my screen's not showing up. Sorry, I'm still doing that. It's not doing the mirroring. It probably changed when you went into display mode. Yeah, yeah. To go to display settings. It's if when he goes into display mode, it's okay. going to do that. Transfer back. Yeah. 
Can you just do, can you just go from the other mode? Can, can, can you yeah. clear them and? Uh, all right, so we're just going to go from non-display mode, and that's fine. But then you don't get all the fancy animations, but we'll wing it, so whatever. All right, so I'm sure a lot of people out here have dealt with MVC patterns before. The basic idea is you have you know, some view up here, or some model that you've got defined that represents some data that you want to display to the screen, and then you want to show that on some view, however that might be arranged. The big challenge here is to hook up these communication pathways so that when your model updates, your view updates and vice versa. That's like the basic of writing a GUI, right? If you can't get data from your view into your model, it's worthless. And so the idea, what Enable tries to make easy is defining this view and hooking up the connections so that you can, in, in a facile manner, um, work with your model and do conversion validation along the way. Um, there's lots of, uh, there are a lot of things that, uh, uh, frameworks out there that do this. Um, some of those, everybody's worked with Visual Studio, probably um, Interface Designer uh, in, uh, in OSX. Uh, if you do cross-platform stuff and you use Qt, you might use Qt Designer. Um, and so all of this was nicely animated, and it's terrible that I have to display it like this. But the idea was that all of those are great if you use those languages, but none of them integrate really nicely and tightly with Python. If you've used Django models, like really there's, what UI system do you have other than the web? What if you didn't want to use a web UI and you want to do some rich client desktop that uses those same Django models. You really don't have a solution for that. And so what Enable tries to do is, is bridge that gap. What we want is a nice declarative markup language that's preferably easier to use in XML, which we think Enable is. And we want to be able to use a rich Python-like syntax to bind to our Python data models uh, in, in a somewhat transparent way. Um, so I'm going to throw a bunch of code at you, which was nicely animated that brought it out a step at a time. Um, but if you can follow my mouse movement on the screen, we'll try to do this. Um, so on the left panel here, we've got a standard Python file, which has the definition of a Python model. And on the right, we have an enamel file, which is an enamel declaration of a view that we want to bind to this model. So the model is pretty easy. It just represents a person. It's got a first name field, a last name field. They're strings. If anybody's done Django, I'm sure a lot of you have. This looks very, very similar to something you'd write in Django. It's just using a model framework called traits that we use it in thought. Um, so the first thing we need to do in order to display something like this to the screen, we need an instance of our model. So we're going to create an instance of a person called John. And then we need to actually grab our view somehow. We need to and, and hook up the model and our view connection. And so if we look at this block, this with enamel.imports context manager, this implements essentially exactly what Guido was talking about this morning uh, in his talk, which is kind of nice. It tied in nicely. Um, what the enamel context manager does, it'll actually invoke the enamel compiler on that enamel module, compile the entire module down to Python bytecode, and give you back a module object that looks exactly like any other Python code you might work with. So I'm actually, so we're actually going out there, we're compiling that module down, getting back a view object that I can manipulate with the rest of my Python code. And I can create an instance of that view, pass in my model to it, and what these red boxes are trying to highlight is that what I've, what's actually going on there is when I assign to that attribute in the view, everything's getting bound up. So these, the value attributes on these fields are going to get bound to the attributes on my model. Now, when, when either one of them changes, my view is going to update and, and vice versa. I can then simply show this view to the screen, and I get a rich desktop UI. Uh, this is actually using Qt at the moment, uh, but it's, you can back end it with WX or WPF or any other uh, toolkit backend you'd like. Um, and so that's a simple UI, right? This is you know, very simple, a couple lines of code to implement. Uh, of course, it wouldn't be a UI framework if you can't do more complex things. Uh, so this would be a simple example that we put together in around 150 lines of code that allows us to interactively uh, test out an image processing algorithm we have. Uh, and I'll run this live uh, if I have the time at the end of it. But essentially what we have, we have a control panel on the left, which allows us to tune in real time all the parameters of our image processing algorithm. And then as we tune those, the image is reprocessed and it's updated on the right in real time. The uh, next screen I'm going to show is just uh, your standard widget gallery. It shows everything that Enamel is capable of uh, doing at the moment. Uh, again, this is all run on the Qt backend, um, but we have support for WX and support for other frameworks as well. So I'm going to do a, a, a quick recap showing the, basically the, the, the key points. Are we, are we at time already? OK, so that's time. Uh, had a couple more slides, but thanks. All right, next up is Pete Chudikowski. Hopefully I didn't butcher that too much. Uh, talking about you the first right. rule of PyCon. And if I get Brian Quinlan on deck, please. Hi, so I'm one of the people that is, you know, this is my first time at PyCon. Loved the experience, every minute of it. Uh, so I wanted to share with you uh, some of the lessons that I've learned along the way and some of the things that I sh kind of wish I would have known and things that sort of became rules that I will follow 
uh, coming into the next PyCons. So the first rule of PyCon is you do not pack t-shirts for PyCon. <laughs> If you do wear a t-shirt uh, that is programming related, try to pick one that doesn't uh, refer to a language which uses dollar signs for variables. This may induce spontaneous eye bleeding from people who mistake it for Perl. <laughs> you better hope I don't run out of these. <laughs> All right. so. At any conference like this, there's a ton of great hackers, you know, very good coders, brilliant, very good looking. Um, and all of that is fantastic, uh, but that doesn't necessarily make you a very good presenter. And knowing that this, you know, presenting is not my strong suit, as you can tell, um, I have a, a fun little tool that I decided to always use whenever I do a talk, and that's the Takahashi style method of slides, which essentially, if you don't know, uh, calls for slides that uh, have as little displayed on them, just the main idea, so that uh, you can allow your audience to pay attention to what it is that you have to say, rather than trying to catch up to reading the novella that you're inevitably about to swipe from under them. And, <laughs> and I'm sure you will appreciate that if you have just come back from a talk that does the exact opposite. Okay, one of the very important rules at PyCon is the bathroom protocol. Gentlemen, whenever you go into a bathroom in between talks, there's a very strict protocol that must be followed. Uh, I call it ASP, the airport security protocol. Uh, what that means is you get ready while waiting in line. As soon as the spot opens up, you rush in, do your business as soon as humanly possible because you know that you got to get out of there because there's a shit ton of people behind you and they're impatient. Uh, the only rule that is semi-serious that um, I'm definitely going to follow, uh, and if you haven't done so, please do, go to the boffs. They're a fantastic experience, and my brain was flush with serotonin as I've learned what it is that really makes this community great. And, and, and you learn that at the boffs. So if you're not going to the boffs at PyCon, you're really missing out, and you should do that next time. Uh, you might also be missing out on interesting and uh, new acronyms. Uh, that I've learned at the buff I attended. Uh, specifically, that was the GDD, the Guilt Driven Design. <laughs> and uh, if the person who came up with it is here, we've verified that guilthub.com is available for registration. <laughs> so as I said, this was my first time, and uh, I wanted to set myself a rule uh, for my first time. If this is your first time at PyCon, you have to do a lightning talk. <laughs>I do very much wish we had time for all of that. Uh, next up is Brian Quinlan, who will be speaking about checking up on Guido. And can I get uh, Tarek Hussein on deck, please? Um, hi, everyone. My name is Brian. And I'm feeling really conflicted right now. We heard from Guido this morning that the gill is not a problem. But I've heard a lot before that the gill is a problem. And um, not being a total fanboy, um, I thought I'd <laughs> check up on him a bit. So he said something about uh, URL fetching. It shouldn't matter. You know, you should get parallelism if you use threads. So I had this code where I like downloaded a bunch of URLs. I had to change it slightly because the conference internet doesn't work, so I replaced it with just sleeping for two seconds. And uh, as an approximation of the output of the first URL, I just output I love Sarah Palin. So, so and then I just time, like I call load URL for all these URLs, and then I measure the time. So... 
So this should take about 10 seconds. And then once we're done this, of course, we'll make a version where we use threads to do this. Um, and we'll see if it's any faster or slower. OK, ten, ooh, surprising outcome. Um, oh, crap, now I understand the, oh, Guido's just such a diabolical genius. Threads are so freaking hard. I'm not going to, how am I going to make, I'm going to make like five threads. Oh, right, I forget there's this, there's this interesting new package that's part of core Python where I can just kind of write, So I just take, I just put this little block here, and instead of using map, I use this thread pools map, which causes all of this URL fetching to happen in threads. Sorry? Sorry, what did I do wrong? Oh. Max worker, oh, right. I think that's a Python bug, not my fault. Um, so, and then we run this and, oh, hey, Guido was right. Now I'm feeling really cl uh, conflicted about uh, Dave. He was really funny in his keynote, but I think it's kind of crap now because he's obviously wrong about the gill. <laughs> but let's give him a second chance. Here's, uh, here's uh, some code that looks at, uh, we have a bunch of prime numbers. We check to see if they're prime. And... Uh, you know, we just print out whether they're prime or not, you know, using the same kind of uh, map idiom that we used before. So let's run this. And this will take some time. It's the world's stupidest prime checking algorithm. Prime, 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 prime. Okay, this is without threads. And let's do it with threads. Um, from concurrent import star with thread pool, whoops. I'm the world's worst typist. Max workers equals five as E. Uh, e dot map. And I would expect this gets faster because Guido said this gill thing doesn't matter. Uh, <laughs> hey, it went slower. What? I don't trust you anymore, dude. <laughs> but I'm suspecting that the problem is actually this thread crap. Maybe if we use a different word, like maybe process, then we'd use multiple processes to solve this problem, and maybe we'd get some sort of speed up. Hey, that, I have a two-core machine, and it was almost two, almost? Actually, it was more than two times faster. That makes no theoretical sense. <laughs> anyway, um, so, you know, the point of my talk was obviously about Python has this built-in module called concurrent futures. It's great for taking otherwise sequential code and making it parallel using either threads or processes, and I would look into it if I were you. Thanks very much. Next up is Tariq Hussein, who will be speaking about solar. And can I please get Damien Avila on deck? Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to my lightning talk, The Solar Power. My name is Tariq, and I work for a small health industry startup named Wiser Together. As you have noticed from my corny title, uh, the talk is about solar. Um, so what about it? We always associate solar with searching, but solar can also serve as your non-relational data layer. And um, you know, like you, you might think, okay, NoSQL, solar. Um, as you might have already guessed, I'm talking about using solar as the NoSQL backend. This approach is not novel, but I wanted to discuss uh, a, a use case that brought it about. First of all, NoSQL. 
So the error in our case was like this crazy performance hit that we took from using um, a SQL layer to retrieve our data. And uh, so we were thinking, okay, what are our NoSQL options? And I thought, okay, why not Solar? Solar is already part of uh, my stack. I like Solar, and you know, there's a lot of great reasons to like Solar. It's fast, scalable, uh, and there are some great interfaces out there. So uh, when would you consider it? Uh, if you have a DB that's frequently read and infrequently, I stress on the word infrequently, you might want to use Solar, you want certain filtering, you want faceting, or uh, you, know, like you want a decently scalable data layer. And what's not so cool about it is that it obviously doesn't support transactions. Not all SQL queries can be translated to something that you, know, you can execute on Solar. Indices can take a long time. Searching and indexing at the same time brings down performance. And um, in order to um, accommodate searching and indexing at the same time, you might want to look at Elasticsearch. But the thing is that you don't have to give up your relational data layer completely. You can create a non-relational layer on top of your relational data layer and get both best of the both worlds. Now, this brings us to the use case that uh, I'm, I'm talking about. We deal with medical survey data, and um, our surveys are pretty extensive, and we ask a lot of questions. Answers are multiple choice. And depending on complexity of the question, there can be 7,000 or more different answer choices. And we get about like more than 2,000 respondents per survey. So uh, there's a lot of data to deal with. And a typical survey question looks like this. And you can see like it asks you about, OK, which of these is, um, arthritis have you had like say less than a year ago or uh, more than a year ago and some somebody picked an option like okay I had this less than a year ago and I had that more than a year ago I convert that into this kind of data um, so one and zero is indicating what got answered what was answered and what wasn't what I want to do is aggregate this data over 2,000 or more responses that we have from the survey, and that gives us like really amazing um, trends, idiosyncrasies, and other stuff. Um, and we then use these numbers to generate like pretty graphs. Now, the document structure that we used for Solar is that um, each response turned into a Solar document, and we added some meta uh, information like age, profession, interests <coughs> of our participants, and uh, things like that. Now, when querying, we were filtering by age, uh, interest, profession to get smaller groups of survey uh, respondents and facet across the Boolean fields. Um, you remember that I showed like I stored the answers as, as ones and zeros. The result is that we know uh, we can filter, drill down through like all this amazing survey data and we can find out what group of people like what, uh, chose what kind of answer choices. So why is Solar awesome? Faceting across Boolean field is amazing. It's really fast. It uses very little memory. Um, combining 3,000 fields for 2,000 documents takes like one or two milliseconds. Don't take my word for it, but like it's it's really fast, and uh, it allowed us to take our API response time for our data service from. 15 seconds down to 50 millisecond. Good to know is that Sunburnt is an awesome Python interface, and you know, like you should check it out. We use that, and um, of course, there's no time for questions. But like the slide is up there, and uh, you can follow me on Twitter. Stuff. Thank you. Hello. Next up is Damien Avila, who will be speaking about doing uh, IPython and HTML slides. And can I please get Chris Withers up on deck? Hi. It's okay. Don't use the mic, just use your head. Oh, okay. Hi, uh, my name is Damian. I'm from Argentina. And I want to show you uh, how to embed a Python notebook in uh, HTML5 slide. Uh, for a presentation. Uh, sorry for my English, is very bad, but here we go. Well, uh, some, weeks, uh, some weeks ago, uh, Wes McKinney said in Twitter that uh, it will be a, a, awesome uh, an HTML5 slideshow uh, where it contains IPython notebook. And two days ago, David Basley said uh, the same. And why uh, we want an IPython notebook in a presentation to achieve a continuous flow in the presentation with, without switch uh, uh, or shifting between the presentation and, and the, the demos. 
uh, how can uh, get there? We discuss some ideas with the IPython developers and we will get a native solution uh, in IPython in the future. But in the meantime, we this is the disclaimer, this is not elegant, but uh, the goal. So you have to download this presentation in HTML5, uh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> or you can modify from this uh, address. Uh, thanks for the work. And you can use uh, an iframe uh, object and get the uh, URI, the URI uh, direction from the uh, Python notebook. So, um, then, entonces, you have to run the IPython notebook and in a dashboard page create a new notebook or uh, load the previous one. And in the bar in the address URI, you can get this address and insert in your HTML5 presentation. Then you have this, an HTML pre presentation that uh, have embedded uh, the IPython notebook and you can run code inside that. You can plot figures, all, all the uh, features of IPython are uh, available uh, in, in this format and you have not to uh, switch between them. Yeah, well, for, uh, sorry for the English and thank you. All right, next up is Chris. We'll be speaking on Media Goblin. And can I get Brandon Rhodes on deck, please? Hi, my name's Chris Weber. Um, I'm here to talk about Media Goblin. Um, so my day job, I'm a senior software engineer at CC, or Creative Commons. Every other moment of my life, I'm trying to help save the internet from media centralization. So I work on this project called GNU Media Goblin. Ooh. I mean, GNU Media Goblin. Um, and it's a media publication system, somewhat along the lines of a decentralized Flickr slash YouTube system. Supports images, video, ASCII art. In fact, it's very extensible. Um, I founded the project less than a year ago, and we have a huge contributor community of about 35 people so far. Um, yeah, most of them small commits. But um, So the web's moving more and more in this kind of direction of a centralized service. But the web should be in this kind of direction um, of individual sites that are kind of that are federated. So that's what we're working on. So here's a screenshot and another screenshot. Oh, and a real screenshot. So uh, yes, I'm gonna just keep jumping ahead. So we have a, an infrastructure that's kind of along the lines of Django minus Django, um, which uses routes, WebOB, Jinja2, SQL Alchemy, WT Forms. Um, we're currently moving from the MongoDB to SQL Alchemy, but I'm not gonna talk about that here. You can ask me later. Um, so to show a few things off, here's our site. Uh, go to mediagoblin.org if you're interested in the software. Um, here's a quick example of a very adorable baby that you just can't resist up on this website. Um, as I said, we have video support. This is HTML5 video playing with WebM. Um, no flash required at all. And, oops, as I said, we have ASCII art support. And it's actually extensible. You could add your own. You could add your own media type. We have a we have a framework that allows for you to drop in new things with a um, like a submission processing and display system. Um, in fact, it uses uh, um, and you can turn on uh, Celery to actually move things out in uh, so that if you're you know uploading video, it doesn't time out as your video transcodes. Um, but and anyway, um, so. Yeah, if you go around on our site, we have some kind of details of the tour. There's all sorts of things like you can turn on attachments so that you can give the source of your files and stuff like that. And uh, um, yeah, if you go around our site, we have, yeah, I keep drawing these weird artworks for our release, but anyway. Um, so get involved if you're interested and help decentralize the web. Um, go to mediagoblin.org, um, click community up at the top, and uh, yeah. Um, did I say anything else? Oh, right. So when it comes to so um, so it's free and open source software released under the AGPL. We're current. Um, I think this is important because 
we have in the, in the current state of things is that free, free and open source software is the default for libraries on the web. If you're going to start working on the web, you're going to use free and open source software libraries, but we're seriously lacking as in terms of web applications. Um, so, um, and we're going to be sprinting, and if you're interested in that, uh, come join us. We're working on, we're going to be knocking out our plugin infrastructure, possibly putting some more media types, such as 3D models or eBooks or et cetera, finishing up the SQL land, um, and working on federation, and uh, I recommend joining Media Goblin on irc.freenode.net. Thanks so much. All right, now we have Brandon Rhodes here to speak about logging tree. of you guys have ever tried uh, from a program using the logging module in Python comes built in with a standard library. How many of you have ever regretted it? Uh, I found that one of the problems is that it's, it's very much a black box. When it starts behaving in ways that I can't predict, then I don't have uh, easy ways to fix those behaviors. Um, Cherry Pie, a uh, web server we sometimes use because it's, it's uh, production quality. They don't warn you not to serve static content with it, so it's great for little apps that you have to go have other people run for you. It writes an access log as an, and an error log in the you know, long-standing tradition of Apache. Uh, but my application needed to write some log messages as well. So uh, they didn't need to be particularly namespaced or anything, so I grabbed the root longer and try to write an error message. I looked at the console where Cherry Pie, has, as I'm running it in development mode, prints out messages. And only the normal Cherry Pie Apache style log message for the request came out. Well, okay, I know that I kind of have to add root handlers sometimes if nothing's showing up. So I added a stream handler. By default, it goes to standard error. The result on the one hand was wonderful. My log message appeared. But now there were two copies of every cherry pie request message getting printed out. So the situation was just finally intolerable. I had to write something. I called it Logging Tree. Uh, the uh, little consultancy, the, the startup I was working for in Atlanta, even though I did this on their time, they let me open source it. It works on Pythons between 2.3 and 3.2. You can just uh, pip install it, import logging tree. There is an API there if you want to explore, but the main thing is printout. It introspects the logging module and shows you the currently configured tree of loggers. Here we see that Cherry Pie has registered a pair of them. There is an imp um, I don't see it. There it is. Here we see that Cherry Pie has created an access and an error log and added handlers to them. But those messages also propagate up to the implicit node Cherry Pie. It's in brackets because no one's ever actually called in this instance, you know, get log or Cherry Pie, but it exists implicitly because of the uh, period separated namespaces. And then I had added, of course, my handler up at the top. And you see the problem. Something produced at the level of cherry pie access or error hits both the handler at that level and then propagates up to the handler at the top. Once I could see what I was doing, it was quite easy to turn propagate off at the cherry pie level, run my little uh, logging tree printout again, and see that I had indeed solved the problem. The little arrow doesn't get drawn if propagate is off. And I now knew that my app would log correctly. It lets you debug a logging configuration, experiment, and learn about how the standard library logging module works better, and learn more about its behavior. Thank you very much. All right, next up we have Tim Ansel to talk about the PyCon live streaming. Can I get Luke Mackin on deck, please? Hi, I'm Tim. I'm the streaming guy, um, as my little badge says. Um, that's the funniest um, photo I could find of myself. 
Um, I'm kind of on a vendetta to video all the user groups in the world, um, but this isn't really a user group, it's a conference, so you'll have to do. Um, why? Because I live in Australia, and Australia's a long, long way away from everywhere. I mean, um, it's a 14-hour flight just to here, um, it's eight hours if you want to go to like Singapore or something like that. Australia's just a long way away from everything. Um, first thing, I'm not doing the recording, I just plug into the end of the recording. The guy is doing the recording and the next day video guys, um, they're absolutely awesome as you probably um, will see if you go and look at some of the videos. Um, definitely if you're doing a conference, contact these guys because um, they do put your videos up next day. Um, I'm connecting to the end of their system and basically trying to live stream it. Um, but you're all at the conference, so you probably haven't seen the live streaming. It's only the people who are watching at home now, um, which I think there are about 30 or 40 people of them, um, that are using the live streaming interface. So I'll give you a quick tour. Um, this is what the front page looks like. You get basically little previews, a little log of what people are saying on IRC, a Twitter stream thing, and you get to see all the stream, preview of the streams, a little description of what's going on. Um, when you log in and you click on one of those, you get a video and an IRC web chat thing and a little Twitter thing down the bottom. Um, if you try and go to this on the conference network right now, you'll get this interface because you're at the conference and we don't want you to crush the um, network streaming video for the thing that's right in front of your eyes. Um, it's designed to try and connect streaming users into the conference, right? You could sit there and watch the videos um, anytime, but you really want to be involved in the conference. So it integrates with Twitter, um, IRC. It basically uses a free node web chat for IRC. So you could jump on and talk to the streaming people right now. Um, it uses WebM. Um, so yay for FOSS. Um, it also has Flash for all those people who are stuck on IE or other things. Also offers audio only if you're like stuck in the Galapagos Islands or something. Um, <laughs> it offers low and high bandwidth version. So if you're on a crappy slow ADSL, you should still be able to get watch the video. Um, the basic setup is we take a DV switch setup, um, we connect it to Flu Motion, we stream a um, kind of medium quality thing up to encoder, which then encodes it to all the formats and sends it to the user. Um, so, how did we go this year? Um, we had one track streaming pretty much 100% of the time. That was this room here, D5, um, which I think was pretty awesome. We had four tracks streaming 60% of the time. Um, there are a few issues with the multi-track stuff. We didn't stream many of the tutorials. I made 100 commits to the code base over the last um, couple of days. We're averaging about 100 viewers. Um, we're entering about 300 megabit of traffic for the preview images, which always surprised me. Um, about 80 meg megabits constant for the streams. Um, that two things always surprised me that they're not the other way around. We had about 3,000 unique visitors. Um, it's all written in Python um, with a little asterisk. Um, Flu motions written in Python, front ends Django, helper scripts of Python. If you've got any feedback, um, this is mainly talking to the people watching at home now, not you guys in here. Uh, email me or tweet me. The code's at um, GitHub. Um, and if you want to see this happen, please talk to PyCon and the PSF and tell them that you want this to happen um, because I'm quite happy to help make it happen. Um, just some other things. Um, I've been developing a portable setup of this, so if you're a user group, you can basically do this. It only requires a power plug. It uses like mobile network and that type of stuff to trunk back. Um, it's a fairly cheap setup, um, and it's very low touch. You set it up, and it walks you through how to set it up, and then you're done, and you don't have to touch it until it's time to close. 
Um, and if you're more interested, I've got a longer talk on YouTube at that URL. Thank you. All right, next up, uh, Luke Mackin speaking about Parasite. Can I get Peter Wang on deck, please? Check. Okay. Luke Mackin, and uh, I'm a software engineer at Red Hat, and I work on the Fedora project. And I just want to quickly show you a little tool I wrote today um, called Pyrosite. And um, just to give you a little background on it, uh, recently I was trying to debug a memory leak in uh, a web app of mine, and I wanted to use uh, Melii, which is a pretty sweet library for dumping out object memory usage statistics. And uh, I wanted to use this without having to alter my program. So um, one day, Dave Malcolm and I sat down and we figured out a pretty cool way to inject arbitrary code into a running Python process. And we do this using GDB. As you can see, we use GDB to attach to the process and then we call a bunch of CPython functions. First, we grab the gil. Then we alter the path, and then we run the file. What's awesome is you don't even need the Python debugging symbols installed for this to work. There's some black magic within GDB that can figure out all the arguments uh, and such. So I released 1.0 a little while ago, and this contains a command line tool. Uh, you give it a .py file and a pid, and it will run that .py file in your process. Uh, it also comes with a little com console viewer for uh, Melii viewing the largest objects in your program. Um, it also has a little API and a variety of example payloads such as Hello World, a memory dumper, and a reverse shell. So during the sprints, I plan to release version 2.0 of Pyrosite, which includes... Oh, boy. <laughs> awesome. Where are we at? It's awesome, I swear. I just gotta find it. Oh, okay, here we go, much easier. All right, so Pyrosite includes a GUI 2.0. As you can see on the left-hand side, it shows you all of the Python programs you're running that have a virtual machine, a Python VM in it. When you click on it, it injects a reverse shell payload that connects back to Pyrosite, and you get a list of uh, CPU usage, memory usage, uh, I.O. activity, thread activity, open files, open connections. And um, actually, this is a WebKit widget. This is all written using GTK3 and the new G-Object Introspection API. And uh, this is actually a WebKit widget, and I inject jQuery into it to uh, do these fancy graphs. We got another tab that shows you all of the stacks for all of your running threads. Then over here, it shows you um, all of the largest objects in your program. Uh, if you click on any of them, it will show you the live value of it. We also have a shell, and you can just execute code in the process. Um, and we also generate a call graph using pi call graph. And, um, one of the coolest things I like to do with this, let's see if I can pull this off. I can't even see it. <laughs> Did I just click on Vim? Yes. Yep. All right. All right. <laughs> Let me just kill some of this. I actually wasn't prepared to give this right now, as you can tell. All right, so Vim, there we are. 
So one of my, cool, one of my favorite things to do is um, you can attach to Vim and I can't even see this. Oh, nice. Thank you. All right. So uh, as you can tell, I just interacted with Vim's Python bindings and uh, altered the current buffer. So there's lots of crazy things you can do with this. Um, if you're interested, I'll be around through all the sprints, and uh, I'd love to hear any ideas that you have. Thank you. All right, next up we have Peter Wang talking about DSLs in Python. Can I get Alexis Tabery on deck, please? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Peter, um, and I'm going to talk really briefly about a little hack I did at PyCodeConf. How many of you guys are, were at PyCodeConf? How many of you remember those watermelon mojitos? OK, all right. Well, if you really enjoyed them, you don't remember them, right? I didn't remember them because I was in the hotel room hacking this crazy idea I had for basically doing a really nice wrapper around an import hook, you know, kind of the stuff that Guido alluded to this morning, um, to let you kind of do your own little syntactic transformations to, to Python code, uh, or code that looks kind of like Python before it, gets, uh, before it hits the, the interpreter. And so um, let me just show you quickly what I mean by that. Um, here's some source code that is a function that embeds uh, embeds a SQL statement. And the key thing here, of course, is this new extern keyword. Right? You're like, what the hell is that thing? So extern basically is the mechanism by which, or it's the keyword I look for when I'm scanning this file to call out to some kind of little DSL processor. In this case, it's SQL. And I'm just going to inline the SQL statement. And you can, the key things to note here are that um, min age and max age are pulled out of the local namespace. And when I'm done with it, name and age are injected back into the local namespace. And so I will show you this thing actually runs. You can see I have a little a bootstrapper, little test script. Um, all I do is I import PyDSL. I register with the debug turned on, of course. And then I'm going to import my module, test1, and I'm going to call the SQL function. And uh, let me just show you the data I'm actually running this on. It's just a little simple database with two tables. Uh, any fans of community here? No? OK, there we go. That's right. Slow clap when I say that. Anyway. anyway. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run this, and you'll see it actually it works, right? Very, say what? Streets ahead. That's right. Um, so basically, the, the idea here is to be able to embed you know, this sort of thing. And if you look what it actually does, it's very simple. Um, basically, it, uh, it just transforms the input. It basically calls pydsl.interpreters. It looks for one called SQL, passes in the arguments, and then it just triple quotes the string. You're like, well, that's pretty obvious, right? But it's a nice little you know, wrapper around this stuff. This is a nice little trick that Nick Coughlin turned me on to. Um, that apparently, I, he said it doesn't work in Python 3. But anyway, this is a way of injecting back into kind of the, the enclosing namespace. And in any case, this, this, um, this, this thing basically, it, it works. It's small. I mean, if you want to see how, how it, uh, it's implemented, it's actually really pretty straightforward. I've just got an import hook that goes through and creates a DSL importer that you know, loads the right module and then basically does some transformation on the text, and then calls your particular interpreter object. So you can extend this to any number of things. The idea here is to be able to do stuff like, you know, extern Python 2K, or 2.7, not 2K, 2.7, extern Python 3K, extern Cython, you know, slap in some HTML if you don't want to have, you know, significant white space. Um, you can, for instance, resolve one of these long-standing requests from the scientific community, which is a matrix multiply operator. My, my proposal is to use bracket star bracket instead of tilde, bracket, uh, tilde star. But anyway, the point of this, OK, so you're looking at this, and you're kind of probably scratching your head, or you're shaking your head. And so I admit it's a terrible idea. Um, it potentially fragments the language, right? Anything that sufficiently is expressive for DSLs, you end up with people writing all sorts of weird stuff. Um, there's no IDE support. You saw that I had to kind of, you know, uh, if you embed an HTML in Python, it's, your IDE is not going to know what to do with it. Um, you can do stupid things, and no one can stop you. You don't have to ask Python dev. You don't have to get onto Python ideas and be told you're an idiot. You can just do it, right? This stuff is hosted on, on Bitbucket. You can download it. It's a few hundred lines. It works. It's pure Python. 
It's a very bad implementation, as you saw. Basically, it's, a, it's a, just a macro preprocessor. It's, you could do essentially the same thing with triple quotes and exec. You're really playing outside of God's house. I mean, you're just running essentially a .h file. You're doing a .h sort of thing for Python. And yet, and yet, in spite of the fact that it's a bad idea, you find that many people actually find this useful. Many people are actually doing this thing already or have been tempted to do this sort of thing. Um, those who don't do exactly this abuse meta classes to do this, to do ORMs. I, I think you guys probably know what I'm talking about. Um, and then the, the, the temptation, of course, is to move on and start abusing the with statement as well. So there's also all these peps for syntax changes and whatnot. We want to have deferred evaluation on expressions, so on and so forth, for small functional transformations. How do we do that? So the idea here is basically to have support for micro DSLs. The idea is that Python scratches 99% of our itches for the most part. It's beautiful language. The last little 1% we can, we can actually tackle with this sort of thing. You just want to tweak a little bit here or there. You don't do stupid stuff with it. Uh, a thousand times no. Do not do that. <laughs> and um, basically, the idea is to experiment with micro DSLs. You don't have to argue about it in peps back and forth. You just play. If something works out well, it's useful. Then we actually have use cases to drive discussion. And so here's some related work. Mython, excellent project by John Real. It gives you a full quote operator in Python, those of you who use Lisp. And you can intercept at any point, basically, in the Python interpret and evaluation stage. There's a great thread on Python ideas from Nick Coughlin. Um, Email me or sign up on the mailing list there. Um, check out the code. Uh, it's, very, it's very small right now, just starting out, but I would love to have more ideas from people who want to use this sort of thing. Thank you very much. All right, up next is Alexis Tabery to talk about Jenkins and Shining Panda. Hey, so uh, I'm Alexis. I'm coming from France. And we're going to talk uh, uh, about testing on many versions of Python at the same time with uh, using uh, Jenkins. So I guess lots of you have heard about uh, Jenkins. Who knows Jenkins? Yes, quite some people. So it's uh, what we call a continuous integration server, which means basically that uh, uh, it runs tests, unit tests, and lots of things like that. And uh, Jenkins is maybe one of the main open source continuous in integration server with over 300 plugins. It's huge. Uh, it's Java, and it's uh, bloated. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so we added a little bit of bloat with uh, our own plugin called uh, the Shining Panda plugin. Uh, so uh, you can fork it on GitHub. Be careful, it's Java. You might uh, fall into boredom. Uh, and uh, it provides many useful tools to work with uh, Python and, uh, and, and uh, Jenkins. So I'm going to do a very quick demo of how it looks like to use Jenkins with this plugin using uh, Pigments. Uh, so it's uh, an open source project to uh, highlight. It's a Python syntax highlighter. So let's just go there. So, oops. Um, beside this. OK, so this is, this is Jenkins. So uh, I'm going to create a new job, just call it demo and select uh, build multi configuration project oh there's here on the on the left you can see that it's currently building it uh, <laughs> but anyway uh, so um, so here the first thing we need to tell Jenkins is where to find the the, the source code so uh, it uh, should be yeah so it's uh, the repository of uh, pigments is uh, a mercurial repository, so we're going to fetch the trunk. And uh, then we can choose when we want to run the test. So we, we can simply pull, uh, pull mercurial, uh, for instance, on a hourly basis. So every hour is going to check if there are changes in the code base, and if there are, it will run all the tests. So then uh, we want to tell basically which Python version we want to test uh, pigments on. So for instance, uh, we can choose all C Python versions. 
So this is provided by the Shining Panda plugin, this part, the, this uh, little uh, 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 Python axis. So uh, when you install the plugin, you need to tell where uh, your, your Python interpreters are installed. Um, so here we're going to test it against all CPython versions. The plugin also supports PyPy, Stackless Python, or Jython, pretty much anything. So then, um, that's one thing that we've added. Uh, it's called the virtual env builder. It basically uh, spawns a virtual env in which to run all the tests. So basically, um, basically you just tell stuff like pip install. Um, we're gonna need a news coverage to run the tests. And then we uh, we just paste the command to to actually run this test. So uh, using coverage, uh, so coverage run tests run dot pi, and uh, then coverage X XML to generate the the files, and uh, and and that's it. That's uh, that's all we need to do to uh, to integrate. Uh, that is to say, to test pigments with all these Python versions. So uh, we can try to run this test, but it takes a little while, so I don't think we actually have the time to see what, what will be happening. So here you can see that uh, we have all the C Python version. And uh, so I launched it before so that we could see what it looks like after the builds are run. So as you can see, uh, basically with uh, CPython from version 2.4 up to 2.7, uh, it's blue, it means that Pigments is working, but it's not compatible with Python 3. It doesn't work neither with Python 3.1 nor 3.2. So uh, well, so that, that's it. Thanks a lot. All right. Next, we have James Bennett to talk about boring Django stuff. And can I get Fabio Pliger on deck, please? Okay. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is James Bennett. I'm the release manager for Django. I've been on the core team for a number of years now. Uh, release managing Django is really boring. It involves a lot of bureaucracy. Um, I'm going to talk about some boring release-related things and hopefully not put you to sleep. So something you may be aware of, Django version 1.4 is coming. In fact, with luck, we will be releasing it within the next couple days. There's so much awesome stuff in Django 1.4 that I don't actually have time in a lightning talk or probably even in a regular half hour talk to go over all of it. We have, you know, the better password hashing. How many people don't want a monkey patch to use bcrypt? You get to do that in 1.4. You can just do it. Uh, Django projects are becoming WSGI applications. We will generate a WSGI.py file for you that is a standard WSGI callable. The WSGI gets a lot easier. We have sensible time zones. We have signing cookies. We have, you know, scary cryptographic stuff that actually works. We didn't write our own crypto, thank God, because everybody says not to do that. Um, we're going to be working on this a little bit at the sprints. Right now, we do have a release candidate out that came out last week. If you know of bugs that could block the release of Django 1.4, please go file them in track and let us know about them, because we are hopefully going to be releasing during sprints Possibly maybe Tuesday or Wednesday is where I'm targeting right now. We will get to announce the birth of a brand new baby Django 1.4. So hopefully that's not too boring. Hopefully I haven't put you to sleep with all this, you know, talk of, oh, humdrum, oh, DB table space support, oh dear. But <laughs> there is one other thing I wanted to mention. <clears throat> this came out of a, a lightning talk that I saw yesterday. Um, this is Django 1.4. Django 1.5 is probably going to be coming this fall. And there's something very important that will maybe, you know, be not quite so boring to people in this room. Django 1.4, coming out, you know, this coming week, is sort of the last in a deprecation process we've been doing. 
The minimum supported Python version in Django 1.4 is Python 2.5. Maximum supported is Python 2.7. We've been dropping one old Python 2.x release with every release of Django. Django 1.5 will support a minimum of Python 2.6. Django 1.5 will experimentally target up to Python 3.3. And, you know, I figure that's kind of boring, but you guys would want to know anyway. So, thank you. Hello. Next up, we have Fabio Pleasier speaking about Alchemy UI. Can I get uh, Remy the Cosmaker on deck, please? So, hello, everybody. I'm Fabio. And... First of all, a little disclaimer. Um, it was supposed to, to run this demo on uh, my Ubuntu boot, but uh, actually I had problems with the projector, so it, it's running on Windows. I hope nothing bad happens. It should, it should work. And I'm, first of all, I'm, I'd like to talk about Al Alchemy V and it's a sort of prototype, uh, an idea. Uh, I have had some some time ago that it's focus, focused on all those people that claims that Euro Python um, that Py Python is not good for GUI or uh, interfa gener interface generation platform interface generation. It's not actually it's not like. Uh, other two other programming languages get, that comes with uh, with tools like Visual Studio or Qt or whatever and uh, where you can just build your stuff really quickly and have your own own interface but the, the other hand it's true uh, many times I have to work with uh, people with other degrees they are not developers they have their own little scripts and they just want some little interface that to edit their stuff so the main idea is that to have a, a, a little lightweight uh, module that interfaces their, their own uh, stuff and creates uh, the GUI for them. So I'll, I'll try to do some live demo right now. And this code is a copy of a part of the SQL Alchemy uh, tutorial. It's very easy. You have your two models, one model user with simple simple fields, columns, and, and the address model with some fairly more complex uh, columns in one foreign key column. And so let's execute it inside the shell, the interpreter. It should have take some time. Okay, so now I have the, the objects right here, add user, and it's an, an instance of the, the model. And I would like to do something like add user, like configure, and just edit my stuff, but I can't. I made this prototype. that tries to be as lightweight as possible. And on Windows, it takes a little bit more. On, on Ubuntu, it's just very fast. And the main idea here is like to patch the object. OK, so I forgot to the engine. And right now, I can run something like this, and it should work. Uh, yeah, OK, it's down there here. And it generates the GUI for the, the model. And this, this is quite simple, and it just wraps the object, and now uh, uh, it was full name. Voila. Now uh, I have to. I would like to patch also 
uh, the other class. Yeah. So, oh, I forgot, uh, I forgot the engine again. Okay. So I can do this as well with another instance and. Right now, address has this uh, foreign key uh, that points to the user uh, to the user uh, class, and it, it takes everything that is in the session and uh, in the table and do some nice grid to choose it. You can cho choose like which columns to display. It has some nice uh, feature searching features and so on. Uh, let's try and select one, okay. Okay, blah, blah, blah. And now I have all my attributes just set. For instance, this is the, the ID of the user. Uh, it also provides a direct, uh, like, uh, simple application interface, and it, it allows you to create some I'm, I'm afraid we're out of time, so I'm going to have to cut you off. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Thanks. All right. Next up, we have Remy DeCosmaker speaking about uh, student engagement. And can I get Ricardo on deck, please? Hi there, everybody. So first, I think we should all just give a round of applause as this is the last day of the conference before the sprints for all the volunteers, all the presenters, all the speakers, the PSF. Just thank you, everyone, seriously. So my name is Remy DeCosmaker, and I'm a research associate at the RIT Lab for Technological Literacy. Um, my job is to connect the staff, students, and faculty with the FOSS community and vice versa. Um, here's some information about where you can find out about us, Twitter, email, and we hang out in pound RIT-FOSS on Freenode. So myself, a few students, and our compatriots attended the PyCon Web Developer Summit. And at the end of the summit, there was a question, how many of you folks are looking for a job using Python? And very few hands were raised in the room, which was followed up with the question, how many of you folks are looking to hire someone using Python? And nearly all of the hands were raised in the room. So where do these types of hires come from? Well, one place they can come from is the academy. How many of you folks here in the audience are from academia or related? All right, so a decent amount of you. And I think this ties in beautifully with the keynote we saw on the first day. Uh, one of Paul Graham's big ideas was changing the university uh, was a transformative idea that was just on the right side of impossible. We agree. So big changes happening at the academy with things like Code Academy, teaching folks to code online in JavaScript. I think they just added some Python lessons. Uh, Khan Academy, which I'm sure you folks are aware of, uh, where they're teaching with video. Uh, Stanford's open courses, which I think are located pretty close to here, if I'm not mistaken. Um, they were very successful this year with hundreds of thousands of students applying. MIT Open Courseware has been around for a long time. And there are a ton of other ways that people are innovating in the academic space. So in our little corner of the world, up in Rochester, New York, uh, we've been trying to do the same thing. So we provide courses, uh, we provide uh, students with co-ops and chances to intern and work with FOSS organizations, and we run hackathons. So last year I spoke about uh, a class that we offer um, based on educational games for fourth grade math. We've had 48,000 downloads in the last year. Uh, we had a poster accepted at PyCon, and these are the folks presenting it. We had a seminar on interactive games and media. We deployed on Turbo Gears 2 and OpenShift using real-time technology in Python land, as well as open web technology. And you can read the open syllabus on Read the Docs. Here's a picture of the class. We run hackathons. We've done things like the National STEM Challenge, Software Freedom Day, a Hacks and Hackers Hackathon, and many, many more. And this is what a typical scene looks like. So, Outside of that, we've placed co-ops at places like the Wikiotics Foundation, Sugar Labs, and we just landed some folks at the UNICEF uh, American Innovation, the UNICEF Innovation Lab at the American University in Kosovo. So we also had our latest co-op, Eitan Romanoff, who's in the audience presenting a poster. Here's a picture. It's basically to create RIT spins. 
or RIT spins, spins for RIT students based on Fedora. Um, if you want to find out more information, you can come and talk with us. So the reason why I want to get up here, and I think this is great, is that we're going to be holding an academic and student engagement open space session tonight at 6 p.m. in Ballroom F2. Um, please, if you folks are interested in engaging with students, hiring them, figuring out ways that we can get people to contribute back to the open source community, particularly within academia, we really want to talk to you. Our students have been kicking ass, but they need mentors, they need sponsors, and they need good projects to work on. So help us with direction and please show up to the open session and come find us at the sprints. Thank you to PSF, Red Hat and Fedora, the CSI, the FOSS community, all of you folks. And here's the information again where you can find us. Thank you. Next, we have Ricardo Kirchner, who's going to speak on config glue. OK. Um, hi, everyone. So this is just a shameless plug. I want to show you um, some library I've wrote. Uh, so this is basically um, glue to glue together config parser and option parser. So you have one single library to manage all your configuration. So you can read stuff from your any files, uh, override them in the command line, just using option parser, eventually arc parser when I have the time to change it. Um, and the nice stuff about this is, well, it supports any, any style files, which is quite compatible with almost everything. It supports out of the box uh, hierarchical layers of configuration, so you can locally override stuff in different files, which is extremely useful for having uh, environment-specific configurations, like production, staging, dev. Um, it's a schema-based configuration, so it, this is particularly important because it allows you to uh, do type checking and other kind of stuff. As I said, it uses optpars to give you command line integration. Uh, it allows you to validate your configuration by type checking schema and stuff. Um, the most basic type already included, like dicts, um, lists, tuples, ints, floats, whatever. And it's quite easy to extend with your own types. So let's, oh, sorry, just a bonus. There is Django's uh, integration via another project called Django Config Glue. Let me show you a bit how this works. So let's say I have a main function which does something. The way I plug my configuration into that is we create a schema, which is, as we can see, a basic, uh, the new trend way of defining stuff um, with the declarative syntax. And then I pass that schema into a function with I pass it also a list of configuration files to read. I will just take those, validate against the schema to, ma to make sure all the types are right, and provide you hooks to, well, not hooks, but pro expose those attributes on the command line. So dash dash my option, you can override that. So let's see how that looks in, in a fake work. So we have our config file here, and then if you call my app, which does something using that config, um, you can see, well, all the configs have defaults, but you can override them in the command line. So as you can see there, you can dash dash foo, sets a value, or you can, it does some kind of parsing to do Boolean stuff. So this is nice. I mean, this is used, being used in production, so it kind of works. And it has dogs. You go to those URLs and see it for yourself. If you like it, please come by on IRC in Freenode, and I'm, I'll be glad to, to guide you in and help you out if you want to try this. Thank you. Up next, we have Brian Veloso talking about how to get designers for your project. Hi, everybody. So there's a problem. Is it over there? OK. You have an amazing open source project, and you need a designer. But there's a bigger problem. Designers are picky. Designers are stubborn. Designers have no time. And I'm guilty of all of this. So who am I? I am Brian Veloso. Good job. Otherwise, I would have to throw you all. So anybody, anybody watch uh, How I Met Your Mother? 
OK, good. So I work at GitHub. I have stickers. I didn't say this yesterday. I have stickers. Take them, please. So, so solutions I have for getting a design, designer. This is not one of them. <laughs> Let your project speak for itself. If you have a problem for a designer, you ha if you solve a problem for a designer, you have them in the palm of your hand. If this sounds familiar, you can replace designer with developer. Kind of makes sense, doesn't it? For an example, I maintain Django Image Kit. I've also contributed to a number of Python, Objective-C, Erlang, and even Ruby projects. So be explicit with your design needs. And, but make it pretty is forbidden. I know you guys look like this when you're asking us to make it pretty, but we look like this <laughs> when we see that. You're not, you need to specify your design needs. Design is, it is, as, is as important as any to-do item on your list. And put this in your readme. Put it at the bottom of your project, what your design needs are, so when we peruse around GitHub or Bitbucket or whatever and looking for a design project to help you on, we can see exactly the things you want, it, you want us to do, and we can get started really quickly. Also, communicate early and communicate often, because I hate this. Hey, man, I finished design. Need your input. Took about like you know two weeks on it. Time passes. Sorry, it's not my style. So moving forward, we want to help, and let's let's help each other. Let's exchange knowledge. Uh, I've I've been uh, coding Python for about four years. I've been doing design for about fifteen, and I keep I want to keep learning how to be a better programmer as much. And I've met a lot of programmers that want to be better designers. So hybrids are pretty much the future. Finally, respect. We high, I love what you guys do. I highly respect you guys. I feel like I'm the dumbest guy in the room. But at the same time, please respect what we do. And that we're not just making stuff pretty, that we're actually trying to make your stuff better, more appealing in another way. You guys take care of the back end. We take care of the front end. And more of us are becoming hybrids, obviously. And together, we can make the web not so bad. That's it. Thank you. You can contact me for more questions. All right. And now for our final lightning talk of PyCon 2012, a man who needs no introduction, Steve Holden. Hi there. I want to give you a talk today, which I first gave at Django Con Europe last year. And because it's kind of a lame talk, I thought I'd better keep your attention by telling you that there's a kitten picture at the end. So, <clears throat> we can all make a positive difference to our environment in many different ways. It's good to do that. It's good for our community to do that. And so the point I'm trying to make today is that you don't need to be an expert. You don't need to, have a, uh, you don't need to exert huge efforts. You don't need to aim for perfection. So as a pra practical example, when I was in Amsterdam for DjangoCon Europe, uh, Amsterdam is a city I love, but as you know, probably it gets many, many tourists, and so sometimes it, it comes in for a little abuse. And so as I was walking through Amsterdam, uh, I found this particular little corner, which could have been quite a nice corner to sit in, except there'd been a few people there before me. They'd drop rubbish, they'd drop all kinds of crap, they'd put beer cans in the heather, and, and heaven knows what. So a number of opportunities there. One is to just kind of shrug your shoulders and walk by. That's the American way, probably. I don't know. <coughs> um, no, probably the American way would be to throw another piece of trash there because there's already a pile of trash. The, the British way would be very different, of course. We'd write a stern letter to the councillors at Amsterdam asking what the hell they thought they were doing, letting people produce uh, this kind of mess. But I thought, well, no, why don't I just take five minutes and do something uh, a bit more positive? So I didn't do the whole job. I just, I had a bag with, I had two bags with me, so I put all my shopping in the one bag. I used my other bag to uh, collect a bunch of trash, and then I put it, well, I was going to put it in the bin, but the bin was full, so. I put it on the ground where it probably blew into the canal and made a horrible mess, but <laughs> hey, um, hey we, we have to try, right? So, uh, as a result, I made a small positive difference to Amsterdam. Not a perfect job. I didn't clean up the whole of the dam square or anything like that. Just cleaned up this little area. Definitely made a positive difference. I feel better about myself. I feel a, a stronger connection to Amsterdam and its community. And yeah, it didn't make a huge difference. Amsterdam still pretty looks much the same. But uh, another example in the Python world, which took slightly more effort, uh, when I was writing Python web programming, 
I needed a, a lightweight networking library. And so in 2001, I discovered Async Core and Async Chat didn't have any documentation. And so uh, I wrote the documentation. Now, it's probably the sad fact is that nobody's ever used Async Core or Async Chat since, but the modules do at least have some documentation. So basically, if you're experienced in a community, then what you need to do is some people, you know, they come in, they don't really know what to do. So it's OK. Give them jobs. Tell them to do stuff. When they come to sprints, here you. Sit down, do that. Give them encouragement. I spend a lot of time trying to encourage people to to do positive things. Uh, and you want to make sure that you know, the empowerment's not just with the leadership, the empowerment should be from the ground up, it should come from the community level as well. So the lessons are that you don't really need uh, to be a subject matter expert, but uh, you, know, you can help the subject matter experts by doing grunt work, things like running conferences, for example. Um, it's even possible to, to teach geeks some social skills, and I think that the, the people of Python are you know, fairly example, good examples of principled geeks. So you don't need to do a lot. You don't have to sign up to change the world. You just need to make a small uh, positive difference. Ah, right, and that, so, I beg your pardon? So it was kind of a lame talk. Uh, and the worst thing is I was lying about the kitten picture. <coughs> so actually, I'm going to be using uh, a picture of <laughs> a picture of Alex Gaynor because in the Django world, uh, Alex can be regarded as the standard kitten equivalent. <coughs> Or at least he could until he came of age. Now he's uh, become the developer from hell, and uh, you can't talk to him without getting your head bitten off. That's a complete slander on Alex, by the way. It's completely untrue. Uh, but the reason I, I chose this particular picture was you may know uh, that for a long time the Django community has been associated with the, 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 the uh, pony uh, as, its, as its mascot. Uh, and this is a particular, uh, particularly unusual pony. I have never seen a pony uh, with, with antlers like that <laughs> at all. Um, just to go back to my keynote from yesterday, there were some questions uh, about whether I was going to show my tattoo or not. It's real. So I will leave you with only one thought besides the post-hypnotic suggestion to donate money uh, to the Python Software Foundation, which you can now do in many ways. If 100 people in this room put $40 in a bucket, we would have $4,000 to buy a membership of the Aldebaran development community for Jesse Nola, and he would have his robot. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you, everyone, for staying until the end of the Lightning Talks. We have one more announcement to make. Uh, yesterday, we had the SyncPath tournament, a uh, really uh, nice compi uh, programming competition. And the winner of the MacBook Air was Daniel Lepage. I'm pretty sure that Daniel left already. Is Daniel in the room? Congratulations. And the winner of the iPad 2 was Lucas Black. Is Lucas in the room? 